right. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to um, call to order the there. the Public Services Committee um, at it is 701. So all those um, is Councillor Bowen, here. Councillor Crowley, here, and I am here. And si I would also like to call to order uh, the Committee of the Whole and Councillor Bowen, Councillor Crowley, mm -hmm. Councillor St. Hilaire, Councillor Sweeney, Here. and Councillor Rotondo. Yeah. I didn't get it in alphabetical order. I was trying. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, thank you everyone for coming and welcome. Uh, we are going to keep this meeting exclusively on one topic. That's the parks permitting here tonight. And we don't have an official sign-up sheet. This is intended to be a public discussion. So we're going to have everyone, anyone that would like to speak, come up to the microphone. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with um, members of the public that would like to speak regarding this issue. And then we can move towards any um, city statements or qu questions from counselors. I think that is the best way to approach the cadence of the meeting and when you do come up to speak at the microphone um, I'd ask you to please push there's a button it says push and it will turn green and that will help um, that will turn your microphone on and allow people watching on Bevcam to um, hear you and everything so um, welcome and if anyone would like to come speak I would welcome them to come forward or if Councillor St. Hilaire Thank you, um, Chairman Feldman. Um, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind making a few opening remarks, if, if that's okay. Just maybe to set that the, would be great. The and context. also, I would like to state, I forgot one item. If you could please state your name and address for the record when you do come to the podium, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for coming out tonight. I think after the, the incident at Pete's Park in, on April 4th, it was clear to me that we needed to have further discussion about, you know, what led to that incident and, and sort of, you know, making sure that uh, any ordinances that we have in place, any rules, any, um, you know, processes, you know, be evaluated because, you know, it was clear to me that there was some miscommunication perhaps and, and misalignment of expectations. And so I just want to thank Mr. Doig for coming out tonight from the Parks and Rec Department as well as John Paydall. I see former councilor uh, Dominic Copeland, who I know dealt with this issue as well during his time on the council. Um, I, I, I submitted an order to have this meeting, and I just wanted to read a couple excerpts from that just to sort of set the tone, and, and I'm very interested in hearing public comment as well as an update from, uh, from perhaps Bruce. Um, but I think, you know, for me it was, you know, quite clear, as I said, that, that there were some, some issues related to process. Um, having spoken with abutters, residents, um, students, as well as parents, um, you know, I, I heard all the perspectives. And I think, you know, for me, you know, I know there was a meeting with the students and an apology and, you know, a decision, uh, I guess, a reversal of decision to uh, require a permit. You know, but I'm still curious if, if that decision is a permanent decision, if that is a change in policy, if there was even a policy in place. Um, you know, I've gone through the city's uh, ordinances and have found some some ordinances related to this, and, and I think it's worth reviewing these, as well as our, you know, this is our policy. It's about 10 pages long, and it's very complicated, and it has different tiers and all sorts of information in here. And there's an application, and, and there are rules. And, you know, I, I guess for me, um, looking at these documents, um, it's not easily discernible who needs a permit for what, right? Very, and, and I'm sure folks, uh, you know, that go down to the parks don't don't understand all this stuff. So I think for me, it was just a good opportunity to kind of review this stuff, get it out there. Does it still make sense? We just went through a pandemic. You know, are there changes we need to make? Um, and also hear from from folks about concerns specifically to, to to Pete's Park, but you know, there are also other parks in the city where I know we've had issues as well. Um, and I know we've been talking about youth services globally as well and, and sort of the, f the future of the McPherson Center and, and other needs across the city. So that was sort of the context for, for holding this discussion. I don't have a specific outcome, you know, in mind, but, you know, just thought everybody needed to kind of weigh in and, and see where this goes. So thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor St. Hilaire. Um, do we have any other, I guess I can start with uh, councillors. If any councillors have any statements they wanted to make in regards to this matter at the beginning, at the outset? Okay, thanks. Um, if we could have uh, any members from the public that would like to come up, if you would like to, okay. Rich to book? Yes. Just press the button, and when it's green, you're ready to go. My name is Richard Tabb. I live at 57 Sawney Road in Bellevue, Massachusetts. I attended the last city council meeting regarding Pete's Park. I actually was attending regarding the Charter Commission. I was incredibly surprised to hear about the issues regarding the park. Tonight, I agree there should be equal access to the park. However, there's one thing I haven't heard that I haven't heard, the, the unwarranted attack of my lifelong friend, Bruce Doig. I've known Bruce since the 1960s when he attended Brown Elementary School. He was a wonderful person then and is now. He was an athletic star at Bellevue High School from 1977, 1977, 1974, 1977, the year we both graduated. Bruce played football Division I school. He understands athletics and basketball. I wasn't there when he spoke to the basketball players. I don't know personally what he said. What I do know is Bruce has dedicated his life to the city of Beverly. The rules he enforced came from the city of Beverly. I was disturbed by the joy and the standing ovations the speakers got when they attacked him at the last meeting. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please come come up. Yep. Press the button. Okay. Oh, yes, it's still on. You're okay. still green, so you're good. Hi, my name is Melinda Lyons, and I live at 73 Kernwood Avenue. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, I've known Bruce for quite a long time, and I've only really known him to be an upstanding person, and I wrote a letter to that extent to um, City Hall. Um, I, I did hear some of the audio from that day at Freights Park, and I can only say what I said in my letter, he must have really had his back against the wall. Um, I really feel like he had a lot of pressure from the community to come down pretty hard and heavy on those boys, one of whom was my son, who's a very upstanding um, student and leader in this community, was the captain of the Beverly football team under Bruce. and. Um, he and his friends are some of the most uh, um, upstanding of the community. So for them to be treated that way, and for me to hear the audio, it was it was upsetting. It was uh, a little bit concerning. It, it is not how I know Bruce to be. And I know when your back is up against a wall and you feel pressure from the neighbors to the park and um, maybe city hall, a little bit of pressure, you're, you're in the heat of the moment and the emotion, it's a Saturday, it's your day off, you're not going to come across maybe the best way that you intended. And I think it's great that he and the mayor, you know, made an apology to the boys. Um, the thing that I'm a little bit uh, still really concerned about and confused is why would you need a permit for a pickup basketball game. I still don't really understand that. And none of us, none of the parents, and uh, Councilman Hildare as well, could find anything about a permit being needed for, for you know, a anything of this extent. And I start to think about like other parks in town, like if this was at Bessie Baker, would the same thing have happened? And the fact that it's Pete's Park, and this is um, a park where money was donated, over $300,000 from the state, to make this a public park that everyone can have access to and that people in the neighborhood think they can call Bruce on a Saturday and demand for him to go down there and do something. Imagine how he must have felt. I can only imagine how I would feel. I would probably go down there too and do everything in my power to try to make the situation right, even if it meant having to remove the people from the players from the field, which wasn't the right thing. But I think he needs the support of the city behind him. I think we definitely need to look at the policies that are in place for these parks. Personally, you know, I've, I've lived in other countries and other states. I'm not a native of Beverly. I have been here for 25 years. I have never heard of a public park needing a permit for a pickup basketball game. And again, I'd like to finish by saying, 
I firmly believe that this, if this had happened in another park in town, like for, I'm using Bessie Baker as an example, I don't think we'd be sitting here having this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Yes, please come up. There it is. Thank you. Nancy Marino, 9 Wellman Street, and a long, long time member of the Recreation Commission. I won't tell you how long, then you'll know my age. I'm very encouraged by this meeting, very. Um, as a, a member of the Recreation Commission for many, many years, I still approach a lot of our policies and procedures from a layperson's standpoint, because I am. And I agree with you. This is confusing and it's cumbersome, but this has been developed over the last 20 years. And it's our policy for field and court permitting has always been primarily for our formal major leagues in the city. And this document includes very important information about liability insurance, um, Corey checks on all of the coaches, et cetera, et cetera. But it needs to be simplified on our website for the average citizen. And it needs to simply state what constitutes a league. We'll tell you what constitutes a league. And if you your group fits this criteria, then these are the steps you take. In order to get uh, a permit to play weekly or nightly or whatever on all of our parks and playgrounds. And again, I think I'm, it's unfortunate what happened and why it happened, but I assure you, it's not the first time the Recreation Commission has had to deal with even more painful issues at Pete's Park. Very painful. And I'm also encouraged that you're going to review a lot of our policies and procedures in the Recreation Department, and I hope that extends to other departments in the city where policies and procedures are in place that could confuse the average citizen. You know, on the CPA, I represent the Recreation Commission, and we were just discussing this, that we need to put things in plain speak, okay, to make it very easy for people to understand, here's our process and procedure, and this is how you go about uh, putting in a CPA application and what it takes, et cetera, et cetera, and the same for the Recreation Department. But this document <clears throat> we review every year at our Recreation Commission meetings. And you're right, it's pretty cumbersome, but it deals with a lot of formal leagues in the city that want to use our facilities. And I, I appreciate the last speaker's comments because I wonder if we would be here if it was any other park or playground in the city of Beverly, and I doubt it. But we've taken steps on the Recreation Commission to make recommendations um, we were asked about the hours of operations of our playgrounds last year, much to our dismay. And the Recreation Commission voted unanimously that not only will the hours stay the same, that our playgrounds will not close at 8 at night, but we're looking at uh, designating two playgrounds during the summer months to stay open until 11 at night with the lights on and to be staffed by recreation folks or the YMCA people. So we want to extend that even further. It's very, very important that all of our playgrounds are accessible, they're in, in good condition, we're doing our best, you know, with tennis courts and basketball courts, et cetera, but that everyone understands that in order to make it open to everyone, we need to have some procedures in place. That's all, you know. So again, thank you very much for beginning this discussion, and I look forward to it moving as you move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Yes. Is there anyone else from the public? Yep.
please come up. Good evening, uh, Mike Reynolds, uh, East Garfield Avenue. Um, something I think that needs to be considered if you're going to look at um, addressing use and permitting of these parks is something that many of you are also considering is an overlay district on Bass River, which abuts a park. You're looking at putting 100 plus units, most likely, where the Bolomat currently is that's right next to a softball field with lights on that are gonna be on till 11 o'clock at night. If that's gonna stay, I don't think, you know, new residents are gonna be thrilled with lights blaring in their, uh, in their units. Um, I, I don't think the two can really coexist in that spot. Um, the second thing, um, I'd be curious to find out if anyone had ever applied to, for a permit to use Pete's Park. Because if you need a permit for any organized group, that could include a group of neighborhood mothers that meet every Tuesday for a play date. Does that mean they're going to have to file for a permit and have a million dollars of liability insurance if one of their kids sprains an ankle? It, if what's good for one is good for the other. So it's, it's, it's kind of thin ice to tread on. Um, I've gone by and just parked on a particular day, on a, say a Tuesday, and I see a, a mother and their child playing there. The next week they're playing there. Does that constitute an organized event if they're there every Tuesday at 10 in the morning? I, I, just curious. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Are you coming? Okay, thanks. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Al Visnick. I reside at 39 Middlebury Lane, which is in the uh, neighborhood. Um, I want to thank Councilor St. Hilaire for getting this on the agenda so we could have a discussion as well as everybody else in uh, city government who answered uh, me. Um, so I think it's great also uh, that the mayor and Bruce um, issued the apology and the kids continue to play. And I agree with everything that everyone has said, so I'll try not to be redundant because I had a few things going on. Um, <clears throat> Like Mike had said, after I would review the policies that uh, Matt sent out, how is the line drawn? What's a repeated and regular use of a city field? Because in the policies, that states that's when a permit's needed. I had the same question if somebody, if I took my kids down to the park every Saturday at a certain time to play whatever sport, would that you know, constitute that? And if so, um, according to what I read, that 10-page document that you attached to your email, Page one requires insurance, and uh, page eight later in the document said that the recreation department reserves the right to require insurance. So I think that just uh, reiterates what everyone else is saying, that it can be confusing and cumbersome, and it was probably, um, as I'm sorry I didn't catch her name, came earlier, trying to address leagues versus individual use. I think we also need to recognize that what the boys were trying to do is probably another yet unique circumstance where they were having a school project and they were trying to put together a glorified pickup league that by these defini definitions, uh, I guess, was more organized than, I know, impromptu. So I think addressing all that uh, is very important as you review the policies. I guess the thing that's most concerning to me right now um, and talking about if it was Bessie Baker or some other field that it wouldn't be an issue. Um, unfortunately, with all of the social media and recordings, I did have an uh, opportunity to listen to one comment that concerns me, <clears throat> and I didn't take it down verbatim, uh, but essentially uh, Bruce had said to the boys that himself, Mayor Cahill, and the chief of police had decided that group basketball, group activities would not be allowed to happen at Pete's Park. 
<clears throat> I think to some degree, Mayor Cahill kind of said in one of his communications via email, I'm not sure from his, his chief of staff, or I read in the paper, that they were trying to be mindful of the neighborhoods that bring traffic and parking. If people are parking on the street and using the park, and there's a lot of them, and they're not parked illegally, and it's 10.30 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm not seeing what the violations are and what the problems are. If there's no violation of city ordinances and it's just that there's too many cars being parked legally on a street, which is also my street, I live four doors from there, I kind of think that that's too bad if there's no violations in place. Um, so thank you very much for uh, bringing this up. You know, the good news, bad news is that we are here discussing it because it kind of seems silly on a certain front that after the social emotional issues that everyone's gone through the pandemic, teenagers, the community, et cetera, that they were being asked to leave uh, in whatever manner for something that's you know physically healthy for them to do. And as far as anyone can see, wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, that's the bad news that we're here. But I think the good news is, is that it does need to be more transparent and more clarified for the public moving forward so people can just know. Because at the end of the day, why is there a permitting process? Is it liability? Is it to keep the public safe? Is it to ensure field availability for all groups to want to use it? What is the actual you know, purpose of doing that? So if we can define it and know that it's certain groups that bring large numbers and need liability insurance, versus a Beverly High School senior project that I guess would consider to be sponsored by the school and be in tier one, does that require insurance? I saw the permit said there's no charge, but other than that, I, I don't know what all, that all means. Thank you for listening and uh, opening up this forum. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Hi, my name is Shannon Copeland, 38 Hathaway Avenue in Beverly. Um, thank you for bringing this to light. Um, this situation is greater than just this situation that happened. Um, my son, Gabriel, who many watch on Bebcam because he's a highlight on the BHS varsity basketball. Um, watches him on TV, but he can't go to Pete's Park without there being an issue or a problem. In the height of the pandemic, I had dropped him off before I was going food shopping for our family. Um, and I said, I will come pick you up before it gets dark. We live in Centerville, so that park is easier for us to get to. And he knows he can shoot there without a ton of people being there. So he enjoyed going there. So we're in the height of the pandemic, plus let's just say Black Lives Matters was happening during that time, and my son is biracial. My husband's black, I'm white. Um, I get a call from Gabriel as I'm checking out, and I'm thinking, well, he's ready to be done. No, the call was, I'm here with two police officers because somebody called the police on me for playing basketball at the park by myself. When the police showed up, they were surprised that Gabriel was there by himself because a resident had called and said that a group of kids were there playing basketball and it was getting dark and too loud. Gabe was there all by himself in the height of all of this, in the dark with two police officers. No child should ever be put in that situation or felt that they're not included. I've had comments from the community. Someone had said to me, a friend of mine, well, he doesn't live in that neighborhood. We live here. We live in Massachusetts. It doesn't matter where you live. You should be able to go use any public park. So my question is, why were the police called? Did you look at him and say, he doesn't fit here. Let's call the police. We think he's gonna do something bad. There's already something happening here on a bigger scope than what happened with calling this group of boys, which my sons are very good friends with all of them and support all of this that's going on with them. 
and my children have grown up with all of these boys. This situation is no different than when they were little kids and we lived on Glidden Street and we'd go down to McKay Park and they would make brackets and they would play against each other. They've been doing this since they were in first grade, since they could put a basketball in a hoop, since they could throw a football, they would make football leagues and go down to the park. It's no different. Just because they're a little more grown doesn't mean that they're grown. They still have that little boy spirit in them, and this is just a glorified situation where they were making brackets on a, on a sheet. They just have access to technology now and their, their whereabouts and what they can do and what they can purchase and what they can organize. It's not any different. It's not an organized thing. It's something good that they did together to create more memories because they're good kids and their, their boy-like spirit's never gonna leave them because of this. And I applaud all those boys for standing up and for all supporting each other, because when they jam-packed City Hall and brought this forth to everybody, kudos to them. All those boys are gonna be something great, and they're gonna give back to this community. But the neighbors who are hiding in the shadows and making all these complaints, it needs to stop. There's obviously things that go on at the park, and it happens at every park. There's some things you can't always control, but not including children at a park is unacceptable. And I hope for better. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Matt Walnack. I live at <coughs> Aderisha Lane. It's uh, about three houses down as well from the park. Um, seems like the unanimous voice here is that we de do need to put together some sort of transparent, simple language rules to establish what is appropriate. Um, I, I would hope that when the time comes to put the, that together and to clarify that, that the exact activity that we saw that has brought everyone out here tonight um, is not something that is legislated out. Um, I walked by the two weekends where the tournament was going on, both times with my 11 year old son and both times we both spoke to each other and agreed that that was something that was great. To see so many cars, so many parents, so many kids doing something that was organized and fun and that that's something that I want him to recognize and participate in and aspire to as he grows older. Um, I would hope that that's not something where we set up rules that prohibit that um, and that squash that boyhood uh, spirit that the last person just spoke about. Um, I also just you know would like to say that while the voice of the immediate neighbors of Pete's Park may have not been misrepresented, they've certainly been painted with a broad brush. brush. All of my neighbors I've spoken to, including a couple that are here tonight, um, have thought similarly to myself that this was something that was great and that we hope returns to Pete's Park. I can hear the cheers from parents and, and players from my house and that's something that I would like, hope to hear soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrea Jones and I live at 409 Essex Street just about a half mile from Pete's Park. Um, and I just wanna echo what, what was just said is that I hope I, that as we continue, as you guys look at the permitting rules, that we don't limit children playing at the park and we don't make it so difficult that they don't have a place to go to have fun. Um, it was really disheartening to hear what happened on that day. There was a lot of, um, I think there were a lot of complaints that all got mixed, dumped into one issue. Like there were, I think, there have been issues, I guess, with kids being there late at night or trash. And this particular day, that wasn't happening. But I think on that day, um, when it was addressed, everything was dumped on these on these kids. So I'm not saying that other issues don't need to be addressed. And so the park stays clean and it's safe. But I think we need to make it comfortable. And we need to invest in a place for our kids to go and have fun and hang out. Um, I also, you know, it's, it's interesting because I hear all these complaints about the parking that was there. I live across the street from Harry Ballfield. The parking there is nuts. People park illegally all over the place. No one's, no one's ticketing. No one's, 
towing. And so I think to for a few more cars to be over at Pete's Park and there to be complaints, I think it's a little bogus. Um, we don't complain about Pete's about Harry Ballfield because I mean, what how. It could be worse to live across the street from a playground where kids are having fun. And I think that should be encouraged. I love what you're doing at Livingstone Park, Living, you know, with the, um, the hockey that was encouraged there on the ice rink. There were no complaints, no cop, no kids, there were no cops down there yelling that they couldn't play hockey on that ice rink that was there. So I do feel like Pete's Park was really targeted because of the neighbor that it's, neighborhood that it's in. And I don't think any resident, and I'm, I am making an assumption that whoever called Bruce on that day had a personal connection or cell phone or was able to get a direct line for him to go out because I do think it's odd that he was able to be there so quickly on a Saturday. And I just, I think that we need to be fair for all the citizens and have better boundaries. So again, as you revisit the permitting process, um, I definitely don't think it should be exclusive to, to the children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have any other members of the public that would want to make a statement? I didn't know if it's supposed to be red, green, or what. So. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Councillor St. Hilaire, for picking up this mantle and, and continuing this on because it's very important. And uh, like you said, even Councillor Frady was dealing with the same situation. So this, been, this is something that's been years in the making. And for me personally, um, you know, as a parent and as a member of the community, you look at the clock right now, it's 733. And as of six o'clock tonight, there's no place that kids can go play basketball. Tomorrow night, there won't be any place uh, after six o'clock that kids can go play basketball. There won't be a place that they can play until Thursday, and that's at the YMCA. So there's not great many resources for our kids to actually be able to go out and play, to just be kids. And especially during the pandemic, and, and even as we came out of the pandemic, you know, as I dealt with the residents, I don't want to vilify the residents because I understand you want, you want to be able to enjoy your neighborhood and be peaceful. At the same time, it is a public park. And, you know, we addressed all the safety issues. You now the mayor came down, Bruce Doyle came down, uh, police chief came down, had everybody come down um, to address the issues. And still there's other issues that continued. And I got to a point where I said, look, if it's about safety and everything else will deal with that. But if it just comes down to that, you don't want kids playing, you know, because of the noise of the basketball is too much. It's like we can't close access to a public park, especially in an area where there's no other access. It's like if we're going to take one away, we have to at least open up another, you know, somewhere around this area. Uh, it's tough in Beverly because I know many of the parks are situated right within neighborhoods. So it's going to be noisy. And if especially if you're older and your kids are out of the house, uh, your kids have grand, you have grandkids and you can see them and send them home whenever you want so you can avoid the noise uh, you just want to live your life. Um, but unfortunately, you still have to have access for other kids to be able to go and play and enjoy the neighborhood just as their kids were able to enjoy it. And when their grandkids come, they can go and enjoy it. Um, so that was the biggest issue for me. And it's heart, it's heartbreaking. Uh, even now with my own kids, it's almost like I have to, um, know, get so creative with the schedules just to find a place to take them where they can go play basketball. I mean, I have to go to Ipswich. I have to go to Cape Ann. I have to go, I have to, go to all these different YMCAs just to have them play basketball. Um, and it's, it, it's just not very accessible in the city. So for us to take away one location uh, doesn't make sense. And, and also, I think the most heartbreaking part of it for me was I got to the point where I just told my kids not to go to Pete's Park. I didn't feel comfortable with them going there and I didn't want the issues or the problems. Uh, you know, I understand that the residents want to be able to, um, you know, live peacefully. Um, but at the same time, all these kids are trying to do is just enjoy life and be kids. You know, they're not doing anything wrong. There's nothing criminal. Uh, there's a lot worse things that they can be doing, especially coming out of the pandemic with all the mental issue crisis that we were facing and that we're now still facing and they're just starting to come to the surface. 
you know, for when it comes to equity, the kids of our city and of many cities have the least amount of say. The YMCA, if adults want to go and play, you know, and I'm not against it, but if they want to go play pickleball and rent the courts, they can. If another organization wants to go play and, and, and you know, rent out the courts, they can do that, which means the kids that weren't going to go play basketball get kicked off and don't have anywhere else to go. So where can the kids go and just play, go and just be kids? And that's what I'm struggling with to understand with all of this. Now, if we put any new rules and regulations, it can be to a degree where we continue to limit the resources that we provide to these kids to just go. We shouldn't have to pay for them to be able to go play somewhere. They should be able to just go outside and play. Just be kids, just like when we grew up. I could go to any park. No one called the police. No, no one got angry at us. We just played. We were kids. And that still has to be okay. Beverly has many great parts to it. We're struggling as we move forward to define who we're going to be. And my hope is that we can come together and be the best part of ourselves, where children are welcome, where there's place for the elderly that live within our community, where if you don't have children, you're still welcome and invited within the city. And when you do have children, those children are welcome and invited in the city. That's how cities thrive. That's how they grow. That's how they continue. So we can't cut off that pipeline because once we cut off that pipeline, we start to die a little bit every day as a city. And I just don't want to see that happen. We're better than that as a city. We need to be opening more resources to our children, more parks, more opportunities for them to go and play. I should never be able to say on a Tuesday, sorry, kids, I can't take you anywhere to go play. <laughs> or on a Wednesday, I can't take you until Thursday because there's nowhere to take you unless I try to go outside of the city. To me, that's just not who we are. That's not our character. That's not what we're about. So hopefully we can come together and I hope that we can do a lot better and I hope that we can start to open up resources where we can all live and thrive as a community as we continue forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Would anyone from the Parks Department like to speak? Mr. Dwight? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm colorblind. Is that on? <laughs> okay, I'm Bruce Doig. I'm the uh, Community Services, Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Director for the City of Beverly. Um, you know, I faced the music a few weeks ago, and I'm hearing more feedback tonight. And I don't disagree with providing more opportunities for kids. Um, Council Rotundo can, you know, vouch for me. I've been in meeting after meeting after meeting talking about rebuilding the McPherson Center. I've talked about leaving the lights on down there till midnight every night so kids can get down there and play, especially on the weekends and, and uh, you know, school vacations during the summer. I believe that that should be a hub for kids to play basketball safely until all hours of the morning. I used to play softball down there until one o'clock in the morning sometimes when, you know, the games ran late for whatever reason. But, um, you know, a few things that people pointed out tonight that I just want to clarify. This is the front page of the permit policy you all have it in front of you. If you look at the third paragraph, it clearly says, in, it's highlighted in yellow, regular or repeated meetings of a group of individuals using field slash courts. It doesn't say anything about playgrounds. Doesn't say anything about anything other than fields and courts. This is the field court and facility permit policy. Our considered organized use and require a field permit from the Beverly Recreation Department. Also fees may be charged and all requirements must be met for permits to be issued in defined, as defined in this policy. Um, again, I took this policy from Lexington almost 20 years ago. I modified it for Beverly's use. It's been reviewed by the city solicitor, the city insurance agent and the, the city finance director back in the day. It's been modified almost repeatedly as things come up. The reason this paragraph was added is we used to have groups of, of individuals who would show up unannounced on at our fields and they were AAU teams that charge a lot of money for kids to play baseball or basketball. And they would show up you know, week after week after week. And I'd tell them, if you're organized, you have to have a permit. If you're, if you're not a, a volunteer organization, 
you have to pay a fee. And so I added that in there to make to emphasize that fact. That's right on the front page. Pickup. I looked up the definition of pickup in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. It very clearly says not organized, and it cites pickup basketball as an example of the use of the word pickup. Okay. I love these high school kids. I've been coaching um, football, youth football, in Beverly High School football for 20 years. But the first question I asked when I showed up was, um, you know, what's going on? Mr. O'Neill came over and said, it's a league. And you know, let me back step. From the week before email that I received about a game going on down there, it was organized. It was a referee. The kids were in jerseys. They had reserve players, things like that. I thought it was an AAU team using our facilities. And so I went down there to make sure that they had a permit and that they paid for the permit if necessary. But the main reason is through discussions with city councilors and the city hall, it was determined that you know that's not an appropriate place for organized games to be played. Now, people have said, you know, um, Bessie Baker was cited tonight. Uh, people on blind said something about Holcroft Park. I wouldn't issue a permit for the same exact thing at Holcroft Park because there's no parking there. It's, the basketball court is right across the street and right next to individuals' houses. You know, that type of thing would not be permitted. When we look at permit requests, we look at is there adequate parking for the size of the event? Is it, you know, noise going to be a factor? You know, we have the same issue with pickleball now being we can't put pickleball courts in every park because some of them are too close to neighbors. Um, and excuse me, I have an irregular heart rate, so my heart is racing like crazy. If I pass out, I just give me a cookie and I'll be all right. Um, but, you know, I wrote down a few things again. Um, McPherson, as I said, I would like to see the lights on down there all the time. I know the courts are full-size courts. I know three-on-three -three likes to be played on, on smaller courts, and I can understand that. But, you know, I just, we didn't get the grant, unfortunately, but I submitted a grant request to do a $1.3 million project to include fixing up, you know, rebuilding entirely four basketball courts in the city and three tennis courts. And this was long before this incident happened. And again, my passion is with the parks. I've rebuilt, I've either built or rebuilt 28 parks in the city, uh, playgrounds in the city over the last eight, uh, 19 years that I've been working for the city. And prior to that, I was on the Recreation Commission for eight years. Um, you know, Again, a lot has been said about uh, the per why do we have a permit process? Well, first of all, um, the day after the meeting at City Hall, I received an email from two eighth grade girls who wanted to do a project at Greens Hill to raise money for the dog park. They were told by their civics teacher here at, Memor at the middle school that they should contact the rec department to get a permit. Very clear. The high school girls field hockey team has contacted me right after that to get a permit to run a camp at um, over the summer at the high school to raise money for their um, for their booster program. The high school girls soccer program has contacted me. I met with them at the school last week to get a permit to have a weekly clinic at a field in Beverly, preferably the high school field, to raise money for their booster program. So these kids knew through their coaches, through their class advisors, whatever, to contact the rec department to get a permit. Now, if you're organizing a league as a school project, somebody should have said, you know, contact the rec department and see if it's okay. Again, if a permit request had come in, we would have reviewed it like we review every other permit request, and we would have said, is there adequate parking for something like this? It, you know, the proximity to the neighbors. There have been numerous complaints over the last several years since Pete's Park was rebuilt about the noise and the parking and everything else. So those things would have come into, consider into consideration. But as I've said before, I don't make decisions in a vacuum. I discuss things with city councilors when appropriate, you know, depending on, you know, Livingston, I don't know how many meetings we've had to talk about Livingston and other areas and so forth. You know, I was directed to, to do what I did, to go down there and to ask these kids to go to another park with, I, and I, I don't know how many times I said, you can check the tapes, how, I, I'll give you a permit to go to one of the other courts that's more appropriate for this type of activity. Once I found out that they were high school kids and they are doing a school project, I had no intention of charging them any money <laughs> Um, and again, they, you know, they would have gotten a permit to anywhere else in the city if there was adequate parking and so forth, then, but Peach Park was not the place for that at that time. And again, you know, Peach Park, I take this personally because I submitted the grant request to get the $300,000. Actually, we were awarded $600,000, but we only needed $300,000 of that. I did the grant work. Um, I worked day in, day out with the folks from DPS to build that park. 
I, I grew up with John Frades. We played Little League Baseball together. I went to school with, with uh, Nancy Frades, okay? That park is near and dear to my heart, just like it is to everybody else. But I didn't go down there to, for, to violate the spirit of, you know, park for all. I went down there because it's not an appropriate setting for an organized event of that size. And people can call it pickup all they want, but when you have, again, a referee, um, you know, team jerseys, um, scorekeepers, and you have a 10 league a week or eight week schedule posted online, that's not pickup, that's organized. You know, it's like every other league in the city posts their schedules so the teams know when to show up and when to play. And again, I admire the boys for doing it. If their intent is to raise awareness for ALS and to raise funds for ALS, that is great. But it should have followed the process of submitting a permit request, and I would have, you know, reviewed that with the appropriate folks, and we would have made a decision as a group. You know, and again, I'm glad we are allowing the kids to play if that's the decision of the councils and counselors and and so forth. But um, again, that wasn't something I just did. You know, and somebody asked a question about why I got the phone call. Well, <laughs> because you know I've dealt with those neighbors before. Some of them are friends of mine, and. You know, as a fact, after I, as I was leaving, I had three neighbors come over to me and thank me for going down there. I know other neighbors probably feel differently, but one of them lives adjacent to the park and, or both of them, you know, two of them do. And again, the, you know, one of them is a good friend of mine, one I just met for the first time. But, you know, there's harsh feelings on both sides of the issue here. The bottom line is the park, uh, the permit policy, we can review it any way you want. There's nothing in there that talks about how we review a permit request and how the decisions are made. But as I said, I don't make a decision in, the vac a decision in a vacuum. We ask the, the appropriate folks to you know, give us feedback and that's where we make decisions. Another reason people ask why we have a permit policy, soccer, use soccer out here. Uh, I got an email uh, just the other day that three times last week, there's a group of men who come down to play soccer and they just take over the field. And they came down numerous times when youth soccer was here having practices and last summer, I remember they were going to the high school to do the same thing. And, you know, these are grown men who should be pay, you know, paying to use a field as an adult organization. Every other adult organization pays. And, you know, if they submitted a permit request, they certainly wouldn't be able to use this field or the high school field because they're always being used by youth soccer, youth lacrosse, and so forth. We would have total anarchy if we didn't have a permitting process because everybody wants access to our fields. Again, just this week, I had three groups ask for, to use Dix Park tomorrow night from you know six o'clock to eight o'clock and you know i obviously went with the first request and then they backed down so i called the second person and told them they could use it after i told them it was already being used but if we didn't have a permitting process again those three groups would have shown up unannounced and there would have been a problem so you know we have a permitting process for a reason i used to be the chairperson of the uh, massachusetts recreation and park association um, or, you know, which is the national, uh, the state group of recreation professionals. And I used to chair their youth sports committee. I started it and I chaired it for a number of years. And I do surveys of all the cities and towns around Massachusetts. And I get about 40 responses every time I do the survey. What are your permit fees? What are your permit policies? And you know, again, the 40 that respond, they charge more than what we charge, but they all have permit policies. So people can apply for a permit, be approved for a permit and, and move forward. And again, yes, we give top priority to high school sports and, and Beverly Recreation activities. We want the high school kids to be able to use the field. We built the football field at the high school. We built this field out here. 90% of the time, those fields are used by high school teams and sports or middle school teams and sports. No fee, first priority. And again, if they ask, they receive. We give them the fields. We give them access to the fields. We tell other groups the high school is using it or the middle school is using it and so forth. In this case, again, if I had received a permit request from a group of high school kids to play basketball at Pete Park, Pete's Park or anywhere, we would have reviewed it. We would have, you know, approved it or not ahead of time, but it would have been a review, reviewed appropriately instead of me getting a call on a Saturday and going down there. Council St. Alaire called me on Sunday morning to thank me for going down there to, you know, address the situation. And, you know, again, I felt I did the right thing at that point in time, but then this has been turned around to, you know, I'm the devil and my 30 plus years of youth sports um, background is useless. You know, that people think I'm out to get kids. Um, one more thing, Councilor Copeland mentioned again, a former Councilor Co Copeland, multiple times during his time on the city council in conversations with me and in public, 
stated that we should be generating as much revenue as possible from our courts. We can't do that unless we have a permit policy. So, you know, and I, again, I've coached Gabe, I've coached his other sons in, in sports, and, you know, I love all those kids. But, you know, we have to have a permit policy. We have to abide by the rules. Insurance is a major factor. If we're charging a fee for a group to use a field, then, again, I've been told by the city solicitor in the past, we can't accept waivers. We can't, you know, we have to have a liability coverage. And most of the time that comes from uh, from National Little League or from Mass Youth Soccer or whoever, because the youth organizations have policies to cover them. But, you know, if, a, if an individual group of men or whoever want to play soccer, they have to have insurance. What if they break a leg? What if, they, you know, they can't turn around and cover, we're just covering the city's backs. They have to give us a certificate of insurance, adding us as additionally insured. So. Um, you know, I mean, I can go on and on, but this is the first chance I had to speak about this. And again, I feel as bad as anybody, but I was only doing what I was asked to do. And yes, we can review the permit policy all you want, and we'll make whatever changes you feel are necessary. But it's been in place for almost 20 years, and it has worked because when somebody violates the policy, we can go and say, hey, you know, you're, you're using our fields. You should be paying to use the fields, or you know, somebody else has a permit for the fields, and so forth. So again, you know, I, I don't know what else to say, but I thank you for the opportunity to say what I said. So, um, again, I'm, I'm always, I say this all the time, I'll, I'll talk to, meet with anybody, anytime, anywhere to talk about issues within the wards, the parks, the fields, the playgrounds. I met with Councilor Crowley this morning to talk about Ward 3 and Holcroft Park and improvements that we're planning to do down there. You know, um, I say it all the time, if we had more money, we could solve all the world's problems, but uh, we do what we can with what we have. But I'm happy to talk to anybody. I wish, in this case, people had come to me directly and asked me questions about the permit policy or talked to me about the situation because I feel like I'm the, coming out of left field tonight to have to speak up and, and talk about what's going on when pe people have had three weeks of opportunity to call me. I did talk to one parent, Mrs. Fox, and we had a great conversation the day after or the Tuesday after it happened. And again, um, yeah, I wish other people had taken that opportunity. I would have been happy to speak to them and tell them what, you know, what's really going on and why we have a permit policy and so forth. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Doig. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know if the, if other counselors have any questions sure. specifically. Um, and also, I just want to re remind everyone before we get to the questions um, that we we are not making any any decisions or voting on anything specific tonight. This is kind of a first step in terms of having everyone in the same space to start the conversation so there's no there's no vote on anything it's you know everyone expressing their feelings and you can always also if people are not comfortable speaking um, in public tonight you can always email any one of your city councilors and let us know your thoughts on the matter if you're watching on BevCam as well. I know this is not a hybrid meeting, but if you are watching and do and weren't able to attend, we um, would welcome people to share their input about this process as part of this discussion um, online via email as well. So thank you. Um, Councilor Rotundo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Doig, I know that you just did this policy review last year, correct? The uh, latest, 21st. we changed the fees last year. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think this year, if I'm not mistaken, and I could check, is that on the threes, we review all ordinances anyways. And I believe as a council, that's what we need, that we do, as we're also doing the charter right now. And it's not specific to you where you did just review your policies last year, but maybe it does take uh, time that we ask the mayor and uh, the various uh, committees to review all of their policies to make it a little more um, friendly to the regular citizens, as Ms. Marino has uh, insinuated. Um, so I know it's not specific, it's more of a comment, but I just wanted to make clarify that there was review of this policies and procedures mm -hmm. last year, and I believe, you know, in, you did mention about we are looking actively at McPherson. Uh, it is a collaboration, youth collaboration, and that's one of the top priorities that um, Mr. Flaherty, who's the executive director, Bruce and I have been meeting monthly to really try to see, you know, it's it's dollars and cents always. It's, it's Unfortunately, that's how it comes down to. It's how we keep the lights on and pay for them and as well as keeping it staffed. So I do want to say that that is something being addressed currently. It's just a matter of taking some time. Um, so I just want to put a couple of things as well as, you know, where we're reviewing the ordinances this year. Maybe we can um, ask the various committees to really look at their policies and maybe see 
if they need to be a little simplified or updated. Thank you, Councilor Rotondo. Um, do I have any other questions from counselors? Councilor Bowen? Thank you. And I, I also just really appreciate the chance to, to have this conversation and for everybody who came and, and shared ideas. I've been frantically taking notes. Um, and, and also, I think, helpful to, to hear some of the background on how the policies that we have have been developed, how they've been serving the city. Um, so just a, a couple of, of questions that might help clarify things and then, and then maybe some ideas, too. Um, for right now, in terms of lights at parks, what would it take to get the lights at McPherson on all summer until midnight at, at this point? Is there something well, we'd have to act on or parks yeah. and rec? Or? Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, you have to take safety in consideration. We've had you know, our collaboration meetings, some safety issues have come up. One middle school student said he stopped going there because of some of the issues with you know, language and other things going on down there and he didn't feel safe. So, like I said, you know, whether it's volunteer base or staff or whatever, you know, I think we need to come up with, you know, some way, somehow, budget or otherwise to get people down there to make sure that it's a safe environment and then let the kids come down and play. It doesn't need to be any coaching, doesn't need, I mean, I coached for a long time. The kids would have been better off without us on the field. I played pickup, baseball, basketball, football, Every day at Brown School um, when I was growing up, I was here at eight o'clock in the morning. My parents would drag me home at six o'clock at night. You know, that's when it's fun, not when adults are telling you what to do. But we need to have safety down there, you know, some way, somehow. And I'll volunteer myself to go down there and sit there a couple nights a week and, and uh, just watch the kids play. Um, but that's what it takes. It's a community effort. Again, it's, everything comes down to the community. We have to work on this together. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. And I hope maybe as we're talking budget or, you know, in, in the next couple of Parks and Rec meetings, if we can figure out a strategy to make that happen. And, and I'm sure not just myself, but other counselors would also be happy to be part of that effort, whether it's, you know, volunteering a night to be down there or it's helping just, you know, make that happen. Um, I'll just add, there used to be a group called the um, Community uh, Teen, uh, I won't say outreach, but it was a uh, Mr. Witwicky and George Simon and a bunch of, and they actually went out and walked the streets and talked to kids on corners and brought them down to McPherson. You know, we got to get back to that. You know, we got to get back to getting these kids to go down there, feel it's a safe environment and, and want to participate down there. Just hang out with their friends, but be, do it in a safe way. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. And I think the idea of having some unstructured but safe space is, is key and, you know, having multiple spaces around the city and just thinking of all of our public spaces as as that first. Um, and so, you know, just in thinking about how whatever policies we have, and I think, you know, a process to, to update them along with ordinance review is going to be really helpful. But but whatever is in place, just thinking about how, as a community, we are, we are thinking in that way and, and thinking about not, you know, not putting you or police officers or other Parks and Rec staff in the position of having to enforce these policies in a punitive way and really thinking about, as it sounds like is is often the case, you know, problem solving and thinking about, okay, what, you know, we don't need to overthink everything. We don't need to have everything be structured. We don't need to have everything be overly regulated. You know, the purpose of permitting for the most part is to to have something to fall back on if there's a conflict, right? If, right. if one field or court is being overused. So understanding which courts and fields we're really talking about that get the most use and just having that, that list, um, you know, understanding that sort of line. And there's always going to be some discretion about what's, what's organized and what's not. But, you know, obviously you've, you've been moving in that direction of trying to clarify because there were exceptions along the way. Mm -hmm. But I think as, as we're hearing, just making sure that that doesn't go so far that it can be used not just to prevent, you know, a conflict between a uh, youth organized league and an adult organized league, but between one or two neighbors and a whole group of kids. Because mm -hmm. that's where I think the, the discretion part gets gets fuzzier and just gets hard for people. And so if we're talking about, you know, we don't want two different leagues to show up on the same night and and have a conflict, though I think we can also like work through those conflicts, but we, we want to prevent that with permits. We don't want to use permits as a tool to 
stifle creativity and use of, of the field and give neighbors more, like a few neighbors, direct abutters, more, more power over sort of general, generally accepted uses of parks. And I know that's, that's also a fine line. Like, yes, 11 p.m. in a basketball court that's directly next to somebody's house is different than 11 a.m. at that same basketball court or 11 p.m. at a court that's, that has some more distance. So some of that can't necessarily be captured on paper. So there's always going to be some discussion, but just you know, I think it's helpful that we're like in this public setting and it's on BevCam to, to be able to say out loud and hear sort of the, the majority opinion that our goal is shared of making these spaces as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that you can feel supported when neighbors call to say, look, this one's not a, a permit violation and we're happy to go, you know, talk to the kids with you and try and work out something that will work or where there have been issues with litter, for example, I've heard from neighbors of, of that park and others that, you know, they go down and talk to the kids about the litter and next time it's picked up. And sometimes that's going to be the, the case too. And so I think, it, you know, empowering staff and supporting staff to, to have those conversations without always having to kind of enforce mm -hmm. a rule um, would be helpful. Because the other thing I've, I've thought a lot about is in this case, you know, a really responsible group of kids, really responsive to feedback, you know, worked through, you know, came to a city council meeting, worked through a, a solution with, with you and the mayor. But we also have to recognize that there are kids who are not going to be that responsible, who are going to sometimes leave litter, who are going to be loud, maybe use foul language. And... You know, they need a place to exist as well and to learn how to be better citizens and just kicking them out of public places isn't going to achieve that. So having some spaces where, you know, we're having those, not that we're like condoning antisocial behavior, but where we're really, you know, providing space for kids to grow and understanding that they're not always going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Is, is also helpful. Yeah, and I can honestly say in my 19 years with the city, I've never thrown kids out of the park for playing pick up anything. You know, it's, again, it's when it's an organized event and they admitted it was a league and it was an organized event and everybody else has talked about the schedule online <laughs> and so forth that, you know, the permanent policy came into effect. And again, I didn't do this on my own and say, oh, here's the policy, you have to follow it. It was, I was asked to do it based on, you know, input from, you know, a couple other people. And so, Again, I'm not, you know, I, I know, I understand what, exactly what you're saying. Kids need a place to go. I went there every day, like I said, when I was a kid. Um, and hopefully they respect the property and they respect the, t the carry and carry out and so forth. But um, again, you know, if a permit had been submitted in this case, it probably would have been granted given the circumstances, but at least it would have had the opportunity to review it and think about it. And fields and courts aren't the only thing that we have problems with. We have problems with alcohol in the park. We have problems with, you know, I don't know how many people in the city are aware that smoking is no longer allowed in public property as of four years ago. I oversee the health department. Those rules and regulations were changed four years ago, yet I see people smoking in the park all the time. And I have to remind them, excuse me, but smoking is no longer allowed in the park. Well, I'm vaping. Well, vaping is including in smoking. You know, marijuana is including in smoking. It's, you know, everybody thinks it's, you know, one thing or another, and it's not. It's anything you smoke is not allowed in public property outside or inside. So. There's a lot of things that I have to enforce. Dogs off leash, dogs in the park when they're not supposed to be in the park. I own a dog, so I love dogs. But, you know, these are the things I deal with every day. But when I'm asked to go enforce a policy, I, I do what I'm asked to do. So, um, but again, I'm, ha I'm happy to work with anybody on changing the policy or eliminating the policy altogether or whatever we have to do. But, um, you know, as, as long as it's in place, I try to enforce the rules as they are written. So, and again, we can make it clearer. We can try to simplify it. Most of the language in there, like I said, came from the city solicitor and the city insurance agent and the finance director at the time. Um, but you know, we can you know, we have a new administration now, so we could change that as well. So, okay. And I mean, my my other question is sort of around the, some of the decision making, uh, both around you know a specific permit review, updates to the. Uh, policy itself or something like the the McPherson Center plan um, I think there's always a tension in these kind of things between the most efficient route where you get 
three experts in the room and they make the decision and we're done. And the more public conversation, which takes longer, is messier. People don't agree with each other. Mm-hmm. Nobody's quite happy with the end result, um, but it's usually more representative. And and it feels like in, in this case, that's part of the, the tension that we're seeing um, because there are a lot of people who are thinking like, well, I didn't know that's how it was done. And then there is a process in place, but it's, it's just a couple of people. And so when you're saying, for example, you know, if a permit comes in, I'll run it by the appropriate people. And it's like, who are those people? And can we widen that a little bit? And well, usually again, it's the city councilor or city hall if necessary, you know, cause I wouldn't make a decision in ward one if it didn't talk to council rotundo, I wouldn't make a decision in ward six or ward five or, Ward three, if it was something like that, that we knew already had a controversial past, you know, I mean, there's a lot of history at Pete's Park since it was rebuilt. And so knowing that that was the case, we would have consulted with the people that have been involved in the past, including Council Copeland, who, you know, he was at the meeting, like he said, when we talked to the chief and we talked about, you know, the parking issues and the, and everything else. And so again, I would have, you know, met with them or the neighbors or whoever it took to, you know, certainly the group that applied for the permit to talk about the, what they're planning to do and why, and that would have been taken into consideration as well. You know, it's hard to put down on paper who should be involved in any given decision because there's a lot of people that, you know, have skin in the game in, in a lot of cases. But, um, you know, we could certainly have a policy review committee, a permit review committee that meets on a regular basis. But I can tell you, I get calls every day. People, like I said, want to use this field or that field or this league wants, wants to use Beverly Fields and, and we give priority to the the leagues like Little League, Youth Soccer, Youth Lacrosse that have been using the fields forever and ever and ever, they get for prior, first priority on the youth side. But a new organization in town, we call them, you know, the low man on the totem pole, you know, but they may want to be bumped up the ladder, but they, you know, we still have to take into consideration the bulk of the Beverly youth-based organizations, Beverly uh, adult-based organizations and so forth. So, so again, we can define that as well, but it's just, it's going to be a lot of work for people to, to look at every permit request and try to figure out should it be approved or not, you know, so um, whatever, I'm happy to, to do it, so. I think my last question is just around that. <coughs> I thought I hit it, sorry. Um, my last question is just around that, the youth collaborative, so sort of separate from fields and, and park usage, but broader youth services and, and McPherson specifically. Um, it sounds like that has been revived, which is exciting. Is it a formal committee? Are there youth representatives on it? Can we hear a little bit more about how it's going? Yes, Councilor Rotondo. And I know you have to get going, and I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I'm, I'm looking. We- Thank you, Madam Chair. I will keep it brief. Um, Council Bowen, I'm more than happy to talk about you with the I service the chairperson on it right now with the Beverly Youth Collaborative. We are bringing it back, but I would be more than happy you and I sit for coffee. And I'll talk to anyone who ever wants to reach out, <coughs> reach out to me, but as of respect of time and as well as my own time, um, it is something that we're actively working with. Um, Mr. Doy, Mr. Flaherty from the um, executive director for the YMCA and myself, we meet individually on a monthly basis as well as the group of 14 people that are part of it, which includes the school department, the police department, the recreation department, a city representative from um, the library who's on that, and then there's also eight members of the YMCA and is uh, actively working to get a two to three students from the middle school part of it as well as the high school is a little more um, challenging. So we are actively doing that right now and specifically concentrating on the McPherson Center. But you and I can get into it really into depth and anyone else who wants to talk about it in the future, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Thank yeah, you. I'm sorry. Oh, yep. Just to add that again, I've been on the youth collaboration for 27 years and Tim Flaherty was the uh, was the youth director when I joined the youth collaboration. So we've been work- both working on this for a long time. And again, I think We've kind of hit a lull for the last 10 years or so, five to 10 years, where we weren't seeing a lot of positive changes down there. It was just kind of carrying forward, but now we really want to, I mean, I want to turn it into the youth center where everybody goes and has fun. And uh, that hasn't happened, you know, a new building will certainly help if we you know, can get that done in the next few years. Uh, and that's in the plans right now, but um, you know, it definitely needs to be a vibrant place that everybody can go anytime and feel safe and, and do what they need to do or want to do, so. Thank you, and Council. Thank you, Councilor Rotondo. Um, so, are there any other questions from Councilors at this time? No? Okay. All right. Anybody else has thank any? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for being here and um, representing the city and the parks department in that regard. We appreciate it. Um, is there anyone else? Yep. Would you like Hi, sorry, Mike Reynolds, East Garfield Avenue. Um, question keeps coming up about issues with parking uh, around Pete's Park. Um, my question would be, what are the current parking restrictions on Middlebury Lane? Because there's no signage. Nothing says you can't park on the street. Um, there are some neighbors on the street that have taken it upon themselves to paint white lines, do not parking areas on the public street. And if the city didn't authorize it, it ought to be removed, probably at their expense. They have no business painting on the public street. Uh, if there are no parking restrictions, um, if people are parked facing with traffic, I know that was an issue. One car was parked um, against traffic. I still don't see what the issue is with kids using a public park. It's unfortunate that there are a lot of them, and it's probably their own fault for being so organized. And we, you've got to remember, this is 17, 18 year old kids that are, they have more technology than, than any of us ever had. They are organized because they're fighting against lacrosse practice, lacrosse games, ultimate frisbee, track, um, personal workouts. I, I'm just amazed it's gotten to this point over playing basketball in a public park. So that's all. All right. Thank you. Oh, yep, please. Thank you. My name is Julie Gentilly, and I live at 47 Middlebury Lane, across from the park. I'd like to address the lines. Um, it's a funny story. They were painting the crosswalk lines going across from Arisha to Middlebury. Uh, and my husband said to the painters, the city painters, and his, his dad was a city painter, so you know, he, he was like, hey, you know, people have been parking in front of our mailbox so the we don't get mail. They park in front of our trash and they don't pick up our trash. You know, can we, you know, could you put lines like cross hatches here? And the city painter said, oh, that happened at the, the park on Lothrop. On Lothrop and um, then all the neighbors wanted lines, so we don't do it. So just go down to Lothrop Street and measure and you can draw your lines. And he was like, all right, you know, I'm an engineer. I, I can draw lines as good as the next one. And so he went to Lothrop Street and he measured the lines. So that is the story because. And the reason, and the reason I did it is one day I came home with my car and my trailer and there was a car parked right in front of my driveway. There was cars parked across the street. I couldn't bring my own trailer into my own yard. And I understand I don't have anything against the kids. It's the parking. People park in the handicapped spot. They park on the crosswalks. They park in front of our driveway. I like to call that the trifecta. When you have nobody parked on the street and three people are parked in front of Pete's Park in the handicapped and there, there is no handicap plate. They parked the wrong way and they're parked in the crosswalk. It's like the whole street's empty. Why do you have to park where it's illegal? You know. We asked the city to put up a sign to give enough space for when the kids are crossing the street that the cars aren't right against the crosswalk. And they put one sign up there, and you won't believe how many times people park there. It's a safety hazard. Someone's, and I've seen it, I've seen a lot of near misses there where the, stu where the kids are crossing the street, they're not paying attention, they come out on the crosswalk, and they're right out in the street in front of a car. And I've, I've, almost hit, I've almost hit one of my neighbors because the cars were parked right up to the edge. I have seen the police come once, and they went and talked to a person who was parked the wrong way in the handicapped spot. And they very nicely went and asked them to move, and they did. You know, right. that, this, you know, wasn't a big deal. Every day, at least two or three times a day, 
there are illegally parked cars right in front of Pete's Park. And it's a safety issue, and someone's going to get hit by a car, and then the police are going to, then they're going to come down, and they're going to put all kinds of signage in, and the handicap spot is just a painted handicap spot. There's no markings around it, so people don't know where it ends and where it starts. There should be cross hatching where the other side of the sidewalk, uh, where the other side of the crosswalk mm -hmm. is, so that people. What happens is people come down the street, they park the wrong way, they don't see the sign because the sign's facing the other way, and it's a safety hazard. And there's, uh, there's been a, like I said, there's been a lot of near misses there. And it's just, it's, it's going to happen one of these times when there's cars on both sides of the street and a little kid. And the other reason I put the cross hatching is one time I was coming home and there was a car parked right there and I was pulling into my driveway and there was a little kid running up the sidewalk and I didn't see him because he was hidden behind the car and I almost hit him in my own driveway. So it's... This I, week we've had two people decide that parking across our driveway was where they wanted to park. They parked there and left their car, and I was, I'm standing there like, really? Like, you know, so it's just, we're just shocked by how inconsiderate people are, and when there's a lot of people at the park, there's a lot of cars, and it's a neighborhood. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Yep, please. To press. Oh, it's green already. You're set. Um, my name's Joanne Lunn, and I live at 56 Middlebury Lane. I've uh, lived there with my husband and children, um, adult children now, but we're no longer there, uh, for 34 years. We've lived near that park for 34 years. We've had a basketball court in that park. We've had lots of activities in that park, and it has never been a problem up until two years ago. Um, as you know, the Gentiles just spoke about the numbers of cars that are being parked on the street. They're parked illegally, and it's not one or two cars. It's a dozen, two dozen park cars parked illegally on the street. The safety issues phenomenal. I mean, I go to the park every day with my grandchildren, so I see what's going on with the traffic in the cars coming into the neighborhood. Nobody is against. The, you know, the young uh, adults playing basketball at that court. It was a court that was set up, um, it was a playground that was set up for physically disabled and adults who come occasionally to the park in their wheelchairs. Um, there's a young girl that comes in her wheelchair pretty regularly to that park, and she loves to go on the basketball court in her wheelchair. Um, it's, it's just that the the, the created league of, leagues of games that are now being played at the park um, and the numbers of, well, I guess it's the disrespect for the neighborhood that's a, a, a big concern also. The amount of trash that is being left at the park. I go to the park several times a week with my trash bag and pick up the trash, pick up broken bottles, uh, shards of glass, you know, various areas. Now, I'm not blaming the obviously the kids that come and play basketball there, but I'm just saying these are the issues we're dealing with the park. And then you add in this league of basketball that is held now every weekend. And um, so it's just a concern. And I think that um, the social media, social media has got hold of this. And I think that it really has created such a negative, negative feeling about the people who live in that neighborhood um, that were, I'm not even going to go into what they've described us as, but it, that's not true. That's not true at all. It's like we've all lived there and have enjoyed that park, and people have played basketball there for years, and it's never been an issue. But it is an issue now because the volume of cars that are there, um, the trash being left at the park. And my husband did go up one weekend and spoke to one of the young fellows that was playing a game and asked who was in charge. And he just asked him, he said, look, you know, you played your game yesterday and it was trash everywhere. And he said, and the young fellow responded and said, we, I mean, we brought trash bags today and we'll clean up. My husband said, that's great. So, and it has not been an issue, but it's the volume of the traffic, the cars, the cars parked illegally and 
I guess just being disrespectful for the people who live there um, as an abutter. So, and I just feel, I guess really um, sad that Mr. Doig had to take the fall for a lot of this. And I think that was totally uncalled for. And I just think that it's just social media, media and the adults that got a hold of social media and just add fuel to the fire on this because he didn't, did not deserve to be treated the way that he was treated. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yep. If you. Good evening, Councillors. Lorinda Visnik, 39 Middlebury Lane. Um, wasn't planning on even coming here this evening, let alone speaking. <clears throat> but I, too, live on Middlebury Lane, and it bothers me to hear a particular group being blamed for what's happening there. Um, cars, I live at the top, so when you come into, when you come into our neighborhood, you are almost assuredly driving past my house, or pretty dang near going past my house. People come flying up Whitman all the time, they don't stop at the stop sign. People coming out of the neighborhood uh, fly down Whitman, um, uh, I'll um, guilty of it myself. Um, if I come up the other side of Middlebury home from the grocery store, people coming up often don't stop for me and I have to cross that intersection to get to my driveway. Um, so, and that's every day, all times of the day. It has nothing to do with whether basketball is being played or not, or whether anybody is in the park playing or not. Um, trash pickup is on Wednesdays, unless there's a Monday holiday. And so if someone's garbage cans are not being picked up, um, I can assure you, uh, I'm a nerd, I work from home even before COVID, um, basketball is not being played all day, every day, and not on Wednesdays. So I think if JRM is not picking up the garbage, um, it's not because um, some high school basketball player is down there parked in front of someone's garbage cans. Um, last I heard the UPS, uh, United States Postal Service, USPS, uh, is not supposed to let anything stop them. And so again, if a mailman's not getting out of his truck to deliver mail because a car is parked in front, which I have four children at any given point in time, I have at least four cars in front of my house, and we try to tell our children not to park in front of the mailbox to be polite to the mailman, but there's no rule about that. And so I don't have lines in front of my mailbox, um, and I'm sure as an elected official, I'm probably losing some votes right now for saying what I'm saying uh, based on the neighbors who are sitting directly behind me who have these complaints. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, my children played in that park when it was dilapidated or before it was dilapidated, before, way before it was rehabbed. And um, there are no lights down there. And yes, on Friday and Saturday nights in the back corner, when there are no lights, inevitably things are gonna be happening in that back corner, but that's not happening when the children are trying to be constructive and play a game in a park that was designed to be played in. Um, I, I think that any given day there's trash there and there was trash there before. <sighs> Our city has decided to remove the trash cans and we've had public hearings about that. And so if you want to be better about not having trash, then please, please return the trash cans. Um, and, and last week I went down there um, with some other city councilor, well, with one other city councilor. Um, I went on several different days, um, just kind of to scope it out myself. Um, I walked down because I'm four houses away, and one of the days that I was there, not one but two city trucks pulled up in front. They both pulled up facing the wrong way, one of them in the crosswalk and one of them in the handicap spot, and they proceeded to park and then do their business, whatever was their business in the park on that particular day. And I actually took a picture and I got a pretty nasty, I would have been killed if ugly looks were, you know deadly, uh, for taking a picture of this particular city employee breaking both those rules. It wasn't the trifecta, but it was two out of the three, um, by a city employee. And so I really kind of, part of the reason why I took the picture was just as a joke, and part of it was like, oh, I wonder if y'all are going to get a call about this, that here our own city employees are breaking these same rules that we have people complaining that children are breaking. 
I think the totality of this is very much like when the Cove Park was revamped. And then a lot of people came to start playing at the Cove Park because the Cove Park is a wonderful park in which to play. I've stopped and played on that playground myself, even without a child. And, you know, the neighbors around there all complained too because they were used to no traffic. They were used to a quiet neighborhood. And so I got here late. I'm sure a lot of people already said a lot of these same things. But I live at the top of the hill, and a lot of these problems are problems regardless of where you live. And traffic enforcement is traffic enforcement. And we choose, you guys especially choose, as you vote for a city budget, how to spend our city dollars and how much money to put on traffic enforcement and how many police officers to have. And um, it is unfortunate that some people are, are being rude um, in, in not following the rules, but it, we can't go to vigilante justice either. And so if somebody's parked in the, in the handicapped spot and they shouldn't be parked, then that is a police officer's job to enforce that, um, not a neighbor's. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Still on? Oh, there we go. Uh, Dominic Copeland, 38 Hathaway Avenue. So just wanted to come up one last time just to, to clarify as well. So I think we're conflating two different issues as far as, uh, as Bruce Doig was saying, if there's uh, an actual an event or a league that's trying to use our parks, that's different. They should be paying for that. Um, but I've been called down to the parks when there's just groups of kids playing. Pick up basketball or just down there. Ten kids does not constitute a league. You know, they're just down there playing, having fun with each other. Even if they come down and they say, oh, you're this team, you're that, you know, they're not regularly. I mean, called down there is just kids, not even driving, kids on bikes in the park playing. And it's just because they were in the park playing and the basketballs made noise. It's just causing issue, you know, just kids being there, 10 of them causing noise. So I don't want to conflate two different issues. It's not about, um, you know, in the parks having organized leagues. What I'm reflecting on is just kids coming down and playing at the parks and that's being an issue. So if there's traffic issues and everything else, like I said, when we addressed those, addressed those before, that continues to happen and that's a, a matter for the city as far as making sure people are obeying the laws of parking and, and you know, parking enforcement. But the bottom line issue comes down to just having kids there playing. So even kids that come on bikes, they're just there playing. There's been an issue with them being there. I want to make sure that we, we recognize that because that's the biggest part of the problem as far as how do we address that and how do we move forward and how do we open up enough spaces within the city so kids can play. Um, as Bruce was alluding to, if we have McPherson, we don't want to have just one place where all the kids, we, uh, we have a city of over 40,000 people and it continues to grow. How are all the kids of the city going to meet at one park? to play. It's just not feasible. And as Bruce was also alluding to, there's been safety issues down at the park. So sometimes the kids don't want to go down there because of those issues. And if you have kids, especially if my kids, when they weren't driving, we live up in Centerville, how are we going to get down to, how are they going to get down to the other side of town unless we drive them there and then go pick them up? So we have to have access in different spaces throughout the city for kids where they can go and enjoy it. And that way it keeps everyone from clouding together and having large, huge groups of kids because 10 is not a huge group. But if they only have one place to go, then you're going to have hundreds of kids in one area. And then that's when I don't feel comfortable about hundreds of kids being in one area. I'd rather have different spaces throughout the city where kids can go, where they can play. Um, if we live out in Centerville, you want to go. A couple of parks in Centerville be able to play basketball, be able to be out. Great. If you live out in you know, different parts of the city, you can go play. And if you all decide, hey, we want to get together and rotate parks, whatever, that's fine. Uh, but again, some of the issues that we were facing, uh, specifically at Pete's Park, didn't have to do with organized groups. And I don't want it to become a point where, oh, I see 10 kids. Oh, they have 
they're playing five on five or there's five kids waiting, it's a league. It's organized. Because that's how we played as kids. We went to a park, five on five, who's your five? I got my five. All right, you guys got to wait until we done whoever, who's got losers, who, got, who, who has winners. You know, that's how it went. That's not organized. Now, I understand what Bruce is saying. It's a little bit different. I'm glad they're able to deal with that situation. But I don't want, again, as uh, Councilor Bone was saying, we don't want people to be able to utilize that to stop what is just kids playing pickup. So thank you all. I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate the neighbors uh, that abut Peach Park being able to come in and voice their opinions because that's very important. Uh, because, again, if it comes down to safety issues, we want to make sure that those get, do get addressed. When it comes down to just playing, that's a different ball game. Uh, and, and different things that we have to take into consideration at that point. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the members of the city as well. Uh, this is what it's about. This is democracy, all of us working together. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, former. Um, yes, Councillor St. Hilaire. I'll, I'll be brief, and I, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, thank you, Mr. Doig, for your, your comments as well. And um, I, I had heard a lot of these um, various perspectives during my conversations, but I thought it was important that the Public Services Committee members also uh, hear those conversations and perspectives, um, you know, given, given the oversight role for, for the Parks and Rec Department. I think there's a lot of things we could do. You know, there are ordinances that are on the books that talk about the purposes of the permitting process and, and, and give some um, authority to Mr. Doig. And, and I think that, you know, I'm not saying they're not appropriate, but it you know, might be some, something to look at. And, and we do have a, a regular ordinance review process. Um, communication, I think, you know, pretend, pretend signage, looking at the website, what more we can do. Um, I think looking at the policy, which again, I think is geared towards leagues uh, primarily, which is certainly appropriate, but um, this whole idea of what is organized and, and what, you know, how does that determination get made? Um, I think maybe the Parking and Traffic Commission could potentially look at, you know, potential traffic mitigation in, you know, obviously the, the, the broader youth services discussion. So I think those are some things that we could look at and uh, look forward to further conversation. Thank you. Um, I, I also wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight and for sharing their their words and opinions and thoughts. I, I know that there are always two sides to a story and I do appreciate everyone who took the time to express their their feelings as a neighbor and a, as a part of this community. So and I, I do applaud everyone for being respectful of each other and and um, and of we are a community and this was a good this meeting was a good start to what we can accomplish when we do have respectful conversations um, with each other about issues in the community and we all hear it from our neighbors face to face how that makes things makes makes us feel. And it also helps us as your elected officials try and work towards solutions that can make everyone in this room that express their opinions feel safe and part of this community and welcome. So very appreciative of everyone that came out tonight and took their time to, to really work towards building a better community. And that's really, this is really how it, it works, even if it's a little uncomfortable at times. So thank you. Um, is there, did you have your hand up? Okay. So, yep, I'm, I'm sorry, Lisa, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna kind of wrap things up then um, because we do, we, I think we have the room for, we're supposed to be an hour. Um, so um, if, if, if it's okay, I'm going to um, entertain a motion to receive the order that we have before us and place it on file within the Public Services Committee. Is that right? Um, so moved. All right. All those in favor? Can I just um, comment sort of before we close it? Um, I think it, it might be helpful for folks who are here to just have a sense of when we might report back on any elements of this. Um, so I know some of that will happen behind the scenes. Some of it will wait for the ordinance review that will start later this year. But I don't know if there's any. I do not. I'm not going to willing to commit to a timeline right now on this. It is definitely the start of something. And I, I, 
I have the utmost faith that we are not going to be able to put this to rest until we find some solutions. So rest assured that we are working on it, but I don't have any established timeline in in order right now. And similar to the other meeting I, that we had last night, I'm, I'm thinking that the best way to achieve that would be possibly to um, receive this current order and place it on file. And when we do have progress in that department to have another order submitted to bring it back to committee to open up the process again, if that works for other counselors. So did we have a vote? All those in, okay, Lisa. Yes, sorry. Okay, so all those in, all those in favor? All right, the motion carries three to zero. So I would also entertain a motion to adjourn the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Do I, okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And do I have a motion to adjourn the Committee on Public Services? So moved. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so both meetings are adjourned. And thank you, thank you so much for everyone, for everyone coming.